Hi, this is Low Budget, and in this video I'll be showing some assembly tips for the Necessity version 1.2 circuit board. This is what the assembled board would look like if you were going to use it with an ESRGB add-on. You would install a precision socket in the PPU location and solder the CPU directly to the Necessity motherboard. This is so there's adequate clearance underneath for the to mount in the case. This is the uh, composite video amplifier circuit. It's not needed when using an NES RGB, so I left those components out. All these components up here are completely optional. They're for the microphone circuit. What that does is if you're playing a Famicom game that's compatible with the um, Famicom microphone, this will, uh, mic will detect it and give the input to the game. I mounted a small surface mount LED here, in these pads, and that indicates when the input is active. So when the sound level is high enough, it'll light up that LED. This connector here needs to be desoldered and removed from an original NES front loader motherboard. But other than this connector and these two chips, uh, everything is brand new. When you get the necessity circuit board, it'll come like this. The three boards are connected with small strips of circuit board material. I like to cut the, they can be broken apart, but you can also cut them with a hacksaw. It's a little cleaner. They can use a file to get the edges smooth. This is the uh, circuit board that replaces the original RF module. And this one here, if you're using an NES RGB, it allows you to add an 8-pin mini DIN connector for RGB output and a 4-pin mini DIN for S-Video. It's a little cleaner than just running wires to everything and trying to solder to it. This is what that board looks like when it's assembled. You would connect all these pins to the video output pins of your NES RGB. And they would mount in your case right in this position here. And that would be close to your existing audio and video power connectors. These are spaced exactly three quarters of an inch apart. And if you're gluing them in place, you can just drill two holes. But if you want to install them without glue, there's two additional mounting holes. They're also three quarters of an inch apart. And they could be uh, installed with some screws, nuts, and spacers. I have this board assembled with a 7805 regulator for 5 volts. It's got a fairly large heat sink on it. On this system, I used the, uh, the original cartridge loading slot, but you can also use the blinking light wind. All the di dimensions of the board are the same, so any accessories will work. When you're assembling the composite video amplifier circuit, there are some uh, component changes that should be made for the best picture quality. The composite video circuit's only needed if you are not using the NES RGB. This resistor here, marked 220, that should be replaced with a 100 ohm resistor. 
and this resistor next to it is marked 2.2K. That should be replaced with a 150 ohm resistor. A jumper wire should replace this 100 ohm resistor. And this 560 picofarad capacitor, um, you, can, you, you can leave that out, although it really won't hurt anything if you leave it on. I didn't notice much difference in the video quality. But I was trying to use a different video circuit on this one, and it ended up being worse than the um, circuit I used on the previous version. So I, I made some changes back. But if you assemble it like this, then uh, some of the orange and yellow color colors won't show up properly. So if you're doing a standard build with composite video, you're going to want to make these changes here. But other than that, all the components on the board can be assembled with the component values marked. Well, I could have designated everything with, you know, R1, C1, etc. I put just put the component values directly on the board to make the assembly a little quicker, a little easier. You know, I have to look at the parts list nearly as often while building this. Less chance for error. There are some additional um, points that are used for, I would say, experimental features. Like if you're, you know, know what you're doing and familiar with the NES, you know, hardware. If you want to add the RG IGR mod board with the NES RGB, um, there are some points on here that'll make that easier. If you're not familiar with the RG IGR board, it allows you to remotely reset your NES console from the, uh, by using certain controller inputs and also allows you to change the NES RGB color palette from your controller. Um, all these pins in this row and this row are the same pins for the controller port. They're just an extra connection point. So if you're using uh, installing an IGR, you can use pins 2, 3, and 4 here and connect it directly to the IGR. And for the reset, J1 here is used for, for some different, I guess, console resetting options. If you're using the IGR, you would want to cut this trace on the right side. And then this pin on the right would go to your reset button on the front of the console. And the pin on the left, or well, the left of that pin, goes directly to the Nintendo CPU reset pin. If you want to blank the video, uh, turn the video black while you're holding the reset button, like the original NES front loader does, you can also uh, make a small modification here. You can cut this trace on the left and then bridge that pin, the two center pins together, and then install a 10K pull-up resistor between there and there. And that will make your console video turn black while you're holding the reset button. Otherwise, it'll just show like a glitched picture, kind of like the top loader NES does while you're holding reset. There's a row of pins here for an extra pin for right and left audio, composite video, and 5 volt and ground. That's useful for when using the NES RGB. You can connect the composite pin here to the composite video output of the NES RGB. 